My name is Shane Neumeyer. I am a disabled self-advocate and attorney and activist. I've been working in the disability rights and disability justice field for about 10 years now um, and have been an attorney for about seven. Most of what I've worked on is issues of coercive uh, mental health treatment, defending people against civil commitment um, and involuntary behavior interventions um, such as restraint and seclusion in schools and residential facilities. My first memory of disability discrimination was probably similar to a lot of people's, um, which was schoolyard bullying um, as a young child because I have craniofacial conditions and um, I, well, mostly because of my appearance really, I was uh, chased around the schoolyard, called a monster and all sorts of other things. And um, more, Worse than the actual what people, what other kids were saying was the fact that then and in future years, adult authority figures would say nothing uh, and do nothing. Uh, and that really told me where I stood in the eyes of people who were supposed to care about me and protect me, um, namely that I wasn't considered worth it uh, because of my disability. Um, I, at the other, on the other hand, though, I didn't grow up with a disabled identity. Um, I knew that I was, you know, weird, crazy kid NOS. Um, I looked different. I acted different. Um, I could never fit in, and I didn't even know how I would start if I wanted to, which I didn't really. Um, and so... I didn't fit into the ideas of disability that were around me, which were basically being in a wheelchair, being blind, being deaf, and having Down syndrome were the big four. So I didn't really have an idea that the, the Americans with Disabilities Act applied to me. Um, it had been enacted when I was three years old, so I didn't have a memory of that moment, but it really only uh, occurred to me that I would be protected under it as an adult. Um, and I have not yet gotten to a point where I, I have been able or willing to use it. There's been times where I probably could have to um, establish that I had a right to somebody, right to something, or um, that I was being denied that right, but I haven't quite gotten to the point of pulling the trigger, as it were, and filing a lawsuit, for instance, or demanding accommodations under threat of legal action. So as I kind of alluded to before, I haven't, um, in my own life, made use of the ADA. I am sure that in ways that I'm not aware of, I have more opportunities and uh, more access to spaces and to experiences that I might not have otherwise before it was enacted, but it's kind of hard to say because it was enacted pretty much when I, when I was a small child. Um, what I do notice through my work is, unfortunately, people's idea of what discrimination is and what accessibility looks like and what civil rights looks like is very limited in the area of disability rights and many other uh, circumstances, to be honest. Um, for instance, most people seem to think that the yeah. obligations under the ADA are to put a ramp into a building which obviously is important, and a lot of people don't even think they should be required to do that much, but that's a small piece of it, or that you can't fire somebody for being blind, uh, something along those lines. Uh, and in the work I do where people are being essentially tortured for disability-related um, behaviors or um, aspects of themselves, um, mostly in the context of people in special education and mental health treatment facilities. They're being restrained, put in solitary confinement, also known as seclusion. 
There's one place at least that still uses electric shock as a form of reversing therapy on autistic people. That's not thought of as discrimination, even though it literally is because you're harming somebody because of manifestations of their disability. Um, and to have that not only recognized, but acted upon, that that is a form of discrimination would go a long way to uh, improving the quality of life of more disabled people than one might think, let alone wants to think. One thing that I think that really needs to change to make other progress, and it seems so minor, but it's foundational, is to broaden the idea of what disability is and like what access needs are. Again, there's a very small number of things when I was growing up, especially that were considered disabilities and um, that are still thought of when people think disability. And there are only a few accommodations that people are even aware of. Um, you know, ramps, maybe taking more time on a test, um, braille, and a few other things. But for instance, if we were to understand that flashing lights on cameras and uh, like signs are an epilepsy hazard, or that um, a person, for instance, needs to have non-fluorescent lighting to even function at work, or that um, loud sounds can be physically painful, to say nothing of distracting if you're autistic. Uh, things like that, especially when it comes to invisible disabilities, um, there's not a widespread understanding of both what's actually out there as far as disabilities and what access needs are and how they can be accommodated. So that would be a starting point for a much wider understanding of disability rights and accessibility. One thing that would really help is for uh, disabled people, our allies, our representatives in advocacy organizations to make sure that all disabilities are being thought about, are considered worthy of inclusion and protection, that we're not either unconsciously excluding people uh, because we don't even know that they exist. For instance, people with chronic pain often get left out in the cold. Um, that we're not saying, oh no, we deserve rights, of, uh, we can be included, but those people, those people are scary and can be locked up and shouldn't be considered part of us. Um, that we're not in silos where some people are only looking at developmental disabilities, some people are only looking at um, physical disabilities, some people are only dealing with um, psychosocial disabilities, usually called mental illness, and there's not a cross-disability understanding, especially because so many of us fall into that category of people who have one or more of these categories. And I think that the, if only because so many of us come out of our childhoods with immense amounts of trauma and all the mental health things that follow from that, I would think it's more common than not that disabled people fall into more categories than one. Um, so working together on all those, not leaving anybody out in the cold, throwing anybody under the bus, and insisting that all of our access needs are going to be met is crucial. 